So welcome, Nate. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Chloe. Thanks for the invite. It's a delight to be on with you. I loved reading your book. The new book's called The Confident Mind. Can you share a bit about what you do and how you came to write this book? My job for the last 29 years at West Point has been to direct a program of mental skills training. We're taking the somewhat difficult to grasp intangibles of human performance, confidence, focus, composure, these things that we all know that are very important, but we rarely pay attention to them. And it's been my job to break these somewhat intangible, somewhat abstract concepts down into practicable steps so that our young men and women at the U.S. Military Academy who are training to become leaders, who are training to operate in potentially very stressful situations, really have a greater control of their own thought process and their own emotional process so that they indeed have a chance to execute at the top levels of their ability. Outside of West Point, I have a consulting practice where I work with some other high level athletes, some uh, entrepreneurs, some surgical groups, medical doctors. And it's been a great opportunity to share those same insights and to really help people become better versions of themselves through optimizing the way they think about themselves, the way they think about their work, and the way they process and interpret all the things that happen in the context of their work or their sport or their passion. So interesting. Can, can you share a bit about what what are people struggling with when they come to you? What are the sorts of things people are going through when they, they seek your help? People come to me because they have a sense that they really could be getting better grades, running faster, jumping higher, lifting more, playing football better, boxing better, they, their movement quality, their execution quality. They have a sense that it could be better, but they are held back by their own sense of insecurity, their own hesitation, um, their own self-doubt, and they need some help working with that, working through that, so that they can enter into an exam or a test or a job interview or an athletic contest feeling comfortable, feeling excited about the opportunity, even though it has, in many cases, tremendous consequences. And, and you talk there about some of these things being intangible, things like confidence. How, how do you define confidence? Because I think it's one of those things where it, it does it mean different things to different people or in different contexts? It, it can mean many different things to different people, again, depending on the context that you're describing. I am very careful when I define confidence to look at it in a very functional, practical way. If you look at the dictionary definitions of confidence, you'll see rather abstract ideas, um, a sense of purpose, a belief in one's capabilities. And there's nothing wrong with that. And that's actually accurate in many levels. But for the people that I work with, and I think for a lot of people out there in the world, a more useful definition of confidence is a sense of certainty that you have that allows you to do what you need to do more or less unconsciously without having to think and plot and analyze yourself as you're doing something step by step by step. I, I give the example all the time of Think of how you are when you tie your shoes. I'm pretty sure most of your listeners are good shoe tires. The act of tying one's shoes is a very complicated activity. It requires dozens of muscles and, and nerve endings and a touch sensation receptors. And all of those things get processed in your brain very, very quickly, very, very expertly, and without telling yourself, talking yourself through it. Okay, now I do this and now I do that. And I get this amount of tension here, this much lace here. This is how I do the knot. You do that, you execute that without thinking. You execute that unconsciously. And 
everyone can develop that level of certainty about playing the piano recital, about taking the physics exam, about kicking that penalty kick in the football match, having that same degree of certainty, regardless of where you are. Everyone can develop that sense of certainty. You have to put some work into it, just like you have to put work into actually developing your physical ability to kick the ball, developing your understanding of the material on the physics exam. But you have to also work on trusting that, being comfortable with what you know. And that's where the inner work of confidence comes in. As you were talking there, I was having a memory of learning to tie my shoelaces and it actually being quite difficult to, to learn when you're kind of four or five or whatever age it is we, we learn these things. It, it um, is difficult. It's a complicated yeah. activity. But at some point, you had a realization, hey, I can do this. I don't have to think about it anymore. I can actually enjoy it. And we all have the ability to do that. That's good. That's good to know. I really, I really like that. I know for me, I used to really, really struggle with public speaking, actually any social kind of situation. And now and, of and I've here, done it so many times. And here you are hosting. Yeah. <laughs> and being public. Right. Yes, and you're obviously yeah. very comfortable with it. And now, yeah, I trust myself and I've got this certainty that I can deal with whatever arises. And I know that the words are going to come out of my mouth usually. <laughs> but what one thing I really wanted to ask you was this distinction between confidence and arrogance. And I don't know if this is a, a British thing, perhaps more than an American thing, let me know. But I think especially in England where, you know, there's a high price put on modesty. And if you kind of, if you love yourself too much, that's, a, that's arrogant. If you, if you big yourself up, you know, certain people might not like that. How can we, how can we square that away? The kind of the distinction between confidence and, and arrogance? Well, let me tell you, Chloe, that is not just a British thing. Um, that's a big thing over on this side of the pond as well. We all recognize that confidence is important to have, but there isn't a whole lot of encouragement on a societal level to build it up and build it up and build it up. As you say, modesty and self-restraint are very prized qualities as well. The good news is that confidence, as I understand it, being an internal process, confidence being the total of everything that you think about yourself with respect to a given ability, that's all on the inside. That's got nothing to do with outspoken arrogance. There are people who are naturally extroverted, naturally loud. They'll talk about themselves at the drop of a hat. There are other people who are more quiet, more reserved, and that's the way they've been raised. And that's great. Fear not, ladies and gentlemen, listening into this podcast, fear not that if you were to do some of the inner work to build a greater sense of certainty about yourself, you will be perceived as arrogant or outspoken or conceited or whatever. You can have all the confidence you want in yourself and still be polite, respectful, modest. And I think that's a pretty good thing to have if you wanna have any friends. If you happen to be the outspoken type, well, I guess if that's your style, go ahead and mouth off. You might pay a price for it socially, but if that's the way you're wired, then go right ahead. Unfortunately, we see in the media, outspoken individuals, especially star athletes. I think of Conor McGregor as a wonderful example. He is a loud, outspoken individual, and some folks don't take so kindly to that. He certainly has a great inner conviction about his ability as an athlete, as a fighter. But for every Conor McGregor who happens to be loud, there are just as many quieter, more introverted athletes and individuals who have the same degree of confidence. They just choose to keep it on the inside. So let's recognize confidence is one thing that you have on the inside. Outspoken arrogance is something that comes out of your mouth. Those two things aren't the same and one does not necessarily compromise the other. Good. So we can we can all work on our confidence, safe in the knowledge that that's not gonna I'm not gonna turn into sort of arrogant uh, 
<laughs> no, no, like no. But we, we, we will not be chopped off as tall poppies just because we cultivate a powerful sense of ourselves. I know one of the things you talk about is around how to make positive use of nervousness. And I know that a lot of people will say, you know, people that I work, for example, I just don't want to feel nervous ever again. I never want to feel in any of those feelings. Um, how, how can we make positive use of, of that? I think that comes about when we really consider what it means to be nervous, when we really consider and understand why we experience what we refer to as nervousness, and when we understand how beneficial the underlying biology of nervousness really is. We human beings are hardwired. It's built into our biology to experience an elevated level of energy when we are about to do something that's important, something that matters to us. That could be something that matters to you because you like to do it. You love playing the piano. You love playing football. You love uh, working in a laboratory. Going in there creates a sense of excitement. You can also feel that same energy surge, that same biological shift of energy when you're doing something that's important because you have to do it. You have to take the test in that required course. You have to indeed go to the job interview if you want the job. Be nice if the job was just given to you without that, but the interview is, is a requirement. When you enter into any of those situations where you're about to do something that has significance to you, as well as any kind of threat to you, your body is naturally designed to mobilize energy. Messages will go through your nervous system to various glands in your endocrine system, you know, your adrenal glands, for example, and those glands will secrete chemicals into your bloodstream that circulate back to your heart and they make your heart beat faster so that your muscles can get more blood and various neural pathways will start to fire more readily and, and more frequently, especially the nerve pathways in your stomach. You've got lots of nerves down there. Hence the term gut feeling. Those nerves are going to fire a little more frequently and your stomach may sort of flip up and down that familiar butterfly sensation. All those signals, the butterflies, the beating heart, the sweaty palms, the, um, the dry mouth one might get, the need to run to the bathroom, all of those signals are indications that your body is undergoing a wonderful surge of energy. It's going to make you stronger. It's going to make you more alert. It's going to make you more perceptive. It's going to make you more resilient. Wow, what's wrong with that? I think that's pretty neat stuff. What I hope all your listeners will understand is that when they feel their respective idiosyncratic signals that tell them that they are quote unquote nervous, what they are really experiencing is the arrival of a state of the art performance enhancing chemical custom made by your body for your body that's going to show up at the right time in the right dosage and isn't it wonderful ladies and gentlemen that it doesn't cost you a dime and unlike a whole lot of other performance enhancing chemicals it's perfectly legal isn't it great that your body gives you that so if we can develop that appreciation for the shift in our biology we have to expect it to happen because it's part of our existence as human beings we expect it we appreciate it and we can embrace it and tell ourselves yes this is my body rising up to the challenge of the moment let's go get after it i'm going to remember that i'm going to remember you saying a wonderful surge of energy <laughs> and i love that idea of embracing it and, and saying yes yeah to that feeling I, I, yeah. it's it really is a wonderful gift and i understand that it does feel different and people will say, you know, you, you, you mentioned it yourself. Oh, I just wish I would feel normal. I don't want to feel that nervousness. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to happen to you when you're about to do something that is, let's face it, not 
normal. You are not going to get nervous every day brushing your teeth or filling your automobile up at the, uh, at, at the petrol station. That's just an everyday activity, no big deal. Now you're about to do something that matters. Now you're about to do something that's kind of important. Now you're doing something that is, let's face it, abnormal. You're going to feel a little abnormal, but that's okay. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. Again, it is a matter of trusting that your body is doing what it's designed to do. It's a great, great way of, way of thinking about it. I'm going to definitely remember that, remind myself of that next time I'm feeling, feeling nervous. Can you, can you share about, I know one of the things you talk about is the success cycle. <laughs> can you share what that is? Um, that's my way of explaining to people a connection between your conscious thoughts, the memories that you're entertaining, the, the, the self-talk that you're undergoing in the present, the pictures and video clips of possible futures that your imagination will, will produce for you. All of those thoughts are going to create a, an emotional state, fear, doubt, worry, or excitement, eagerness, and confidence. That emotional state directly impacts your physical body, muscle tension, blood flow, again, hormone production. Your emotional state is going to drive a lot of physical changes. And because we are human beings living in a body, everything that we do, we do in a body, those, the physical state that is a function of our emotions, which is a function of our thought process, that physical state is going to change. And hopefully we are thinking effectively enough so that we're producing the right emotions, so that we're optimizing our physical state, so we can play well in the soccer match, we can play well in the tennis match, we can play well perform well in the physics exam, whatever it might be. How you think affects how you feel, affects the state of your body, and the state of your body is going to have an effect on your execution, your performance. And then, of course, we reflect upon our performance, and it becomes a cyclical process. So we are either engaged in what I refer to as a success cycle, okay? I'm telling myself things like, this is my chance to have a great performance. Let's see how well I can do. I know that I have learned this part of the program, these chapters. I know I've studied well. I'm certain about this about myself. That creates an emotional state of eagerness, anticipation, dare I say confidence. That emotional state will excite the body a little bit, but it'll also relax some muscles here and there. It will open up your pupils. It'll help you see more of what's around you. And in that physical state, you're much more likely to perform well, whether it's a physical task, like playing in a football match, or whether it's a more, dare I say, a psychological task, like solving all the questions in the calculus exam, or giving a great lecture to a class, or giving a good, having a good negotiation in a business setting. And then of course, you get to reflect on that little bit of success which makes it easier for you to think constructively the next time around. So it's a cycle that you will either cultivate in a constructive manner, or if you happen to go into a situation saying, gosh, I don't know about myself. I think we're kind of in trouble here. Um, I, I'm, I'm really worried about this outcome. That's going to create an emotional state of fear and worry. That's going to constrict the muscles. That's going to constrict the vision. That's going to negatively affect you physically. And it means your execution is going to be less than it might be. I refer to that as the sewer cycle. We all know what goes down the sewer. Um, <laughs> let's, stay, let's stay on that success cycle. And the piece in that four point cycle where you have the greatest control is indeed your conscious thoughts. The psychiatrist Viktor Frankl in his marvelous book, Man's Search for Meaning, referred to as the last human freedom, the ability to choose your state of mind regardless of circumstance. That is what can put you on the success cycle time after time after time. Mm, okay. Yeah. So it's really important what we're saying to ourselves, you know, the, the things that we're, we're saying to ourselves in our own heads and the, the attitude that we're, we're bringing to these situations. And that can really set off a, a cycle of, 
um, hopefully positive, more positive thoughts and feelings or more helpful at least. Hopefully that is the, that is the idea. And we all have the ability to do that regardless of circumstance. The idea about the confident mind is to use your ability to consciously, deliberately control your thought pattern, your thought accumulation, your mental bank account, if you will, that repository of ongoing thoughts, control that constructively so that you can create that sense of certainty. So that sense of certainty does lead to a more optimum, more constructive, more facilitative physical state, which leads to the best execution possible at that moment. Let's take advantage of that, ladies and gentlemen. I'm I'm wondering, I, I'm, I'm kind of guessing what people listening might be thinking, because a lot of the people listening tend to be on the anxious side, and they might be thinking things like, what if I can't, I can't control my thoughts? You know, I feel like I am not in control of the sort of thoughts that I'm having. I'm having a lot of negative thoughts coming in. What what advice would you have for people that, that say that? Um, I have been challenged with that repeatedly over the years. Oh, I can't control my thought process. I And I always have to reply, well, give me an idea of how much practice you have deliberately put in to controlling your thought process. You know, do you, pardon the expression, work on controlling your thought process the same way you will work on understanding the formulas in your calculus class, the same way you will work on your cardiovascular conditioning as you train to run that half marathon. Do you actually work at it? And most people will sort of roll their eyes at me and say, you know, I honestly don't work on it. I didn't know I could which means that they're just letting certain tendencies toward negativity to operate without any awareness, and they're allowing that to continue. Everybody does indeed have a tremendous amount of control over their conscious thoughts. They probably haven't practiced and exercised their ability to do so, but once they take the step to do so, they will discover that it can indeed happen. Um, it's no different in so many ways from, you know, you go to a gymnasium to to strengthen your musculature. How many times do you have to go to the gym before you look in the mirror and say, wow, I've changed? It's not going to happen the first time. It's not going to happen the second time, the fifth time, the tenth time. It takes as long as it takes. And I'm not going to uh, try to convince everybody that, oh, it's going to take three months, six months, two years. I don't know. I've had clients come back to me after a single meeting where I outline some of these steps and say, wow, I feel completely different in my uh, lacrosse practice or my basketball practice or my swim workouts. I feel completely different just using a couple of different concepts about cognitive control it could happen to you too folks it's interesting isn't it because we, we wouldn't expect ourselves to have clean teeth without brushing our teeth every day or to be fit and able to run marathons without training but yeah, it's, it's like we're not really taught i suppose in our culture that maybe our minds also need working out our minds also need maintenance we have to have these things in place that we're doing to to have that conscious control over where our our minds I've are going Absolutely. Um, everyone's garden will grow some weeds. You got to pull the weeds out and you got to nurture the plants that you hope to grow. So we have to be very honest with ourselves about the situations, the places, the times when our minds tend to go to the negative, to the pessimistic. I ask people to become very self-aware. We talk at great length when does this stuff pop up? When does that voice begin to challenge you, begin to intimidate you, begin to undermine your sense of certainty? And then are you willing to acknowledge, oh, there it is. There it is. Stop. I'm not thinking that. 
I'm going to think something else. I'm going to recall specifically a memory of progress. I'm going to recall the vision of the outcome that I was hoping to achieve. I'm going to acknowledge my negativity. I'm going to deliberately stop it. Maybe I have to picture a stop sign or a red light. Maybe I have to envision a toilet being flushed, every the bad stuff leaving, and then I have to deliberately insert something more constructive, something that will help me pay attention to what is important now, and in so doing, give me a chance to be effective in that moment. And I may have to do the same thing two minutes later, two minutes after that, five minutes later, 10 minutes later, Please, ladies and gentlemen, don't think that once you do this, it's it's a one and done, you've won the decisive victory. No, it's an ongoing process. One of my advisees referred to it in military terms as an ongoing war of attrition. There is no decisive victory that one can win over the enemies of self-doubt and worry. There's no atomic bomb so to speak, that we can drop on the enemy and the war is over. The enemy surrenders. Nope, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. And I know that sounds kind of pessimistic, but I urge people to look at it the following way. Everybody on the planet is faced with this challenge. Everybody on the planet, even those who come across as ridiculously cocky, and ridiculously powerful. They're all dealing with their own ongoing war of attrition, as well as you. If you can be a little bit better at it than they are, if you can be a little bit better at it than your opponent, your competitor, you just created an advantage for yourself. So look at this process as a way of getting a leg up, helping yourself in the moment, getting a better deck of cards, you know, in your poker hand. Help yourself to do this. It's an ongoing war, but face it day in, day out, gladly. And as long as you're engaged in that process of acknowledging your negativity, stopping it, and replacing it with something more constructive, as long as you're doing that, ladies and gentlemen, you are winning what I refer to as the first victory. The first, you are winning the victory over that ongoing process of self-doubt, which unfortunately is just part of our world. Congratulations for each of you as you do it. Keep going. I think that's one of my favorite things that you, you teach in this book about how actually it is an ongoing practice. It's not just that some people are just born confident and never experience self-doubt. Actually, it's something that we probably all have to continually work on and keep reminding ourselves of and keep coming back to the positive thoughts about ourselves. It's not just like you do it once or some people have it naturally and others don't. Yes, that is absolutely the case. Um, A huge misconception is that confidence is this inherited genetic disposition that one person might or might not have. And okay, then you're just sort of stuck with what you got. Um, No, ladies and gentlemen, confidence is something that is learned. Confidence is something that is built. Confidence is something that is abandoned. It is entirely up to you. You can have as much of it as you want in any aspect of your life as you want. One of the stories I tell is of an Olympic champion who 14 months prior to the Olympic Games looked at me and said, boy, Doc, I could use a lot more confidence. Okay, we did some work. She did the work. 14 months later, she's won an Olympic gold medal. She jumps out of the sled and the crowd is going crazy. The microphone is pushed in her face by the lady from the sports casting television network. And the question is, gosh, you weren't a medal favorite. You weren't expected to be here. Um, You weren't even the top bobsled on the U.S. team. How did you do it? And the athlete said, well, we just had confidence. Something obviously happened during those 14 months between the time when she said, I could use a lot more, and the time when she said, well, one of the reasons why we won is because we had confidence. Something obviously happened. And every one of your listeners 
can undergo that same transition if they so choose. And, and confidence is such an important aspect of success, isn't it? I think a lot of people will say, actually, it's more important than anything, <laughs> you know, <laughs> more important than your intelligence or your skill in a certain thing. Actually, the confidence is the key to, to so many things. So many things. Um, I ask that question repeatedly whenever I'm meeting someone new. Just yesterday, I met a wonderful young lady at West Point who was considering coming to West Point. She was being recruited by our volleyball program because she's a very talented young lady. I asked her, how much of your success so far in your life really has a lot to do with your degree of confidence? And she said, oh, about 85%. And then I asked her, okay, well, if it's that important, I would imagine that you take care of it, that you work at it, that you ensure that you have some when you need it, the same way you work to ensure that you have, you know, um, good leaping ability, good lateral movement, good cardiovascular conditioning so that you can stay alert and stay active throughout a long match. I suppose you work on your confidence too, because you just told me how important it is. And she said, um, gosh, no, I don't. That's surprising. Everyone knows it's important. Few people work on it. Everybody can work on it and everybody can develop it. Mm, yes. Okay. Yeah. I love that. I love that. How do people, how can people deal with failure? I think a lot of people that I speak to, there's a big fear of failure that will, in some cases, stop them from even trying things, cause them to hold themselves back from even attempting, you know, a sport or to, to try something new or to change career or whatever it might be to go on a date. How can we deal with failure or how can we deal with even the, just the fear of, of failure? I think you have to come to grips with the fact that the failure itself isn't all that big a deal. It's the fear of it that you have ahead of time, which is really more powerful. I have people constantly reflect upon, you know, significant quote unquote failures in their lives. And yet here they are still today. It wasn't the end of the world. Nothing huge changed. We are all by definition going to experience some degrees of failure because we all are imperfect in various ways. Okay, since we're imperfect, we know we're gonna fail. Since we know we're gonna fail, we should equip ourselves with some tools to interpret, deal with, process mistakes, setbacks, and failures, okay? The dating analogy is wonderful. The date doesn't work out. I get rejected. I can say, wow, something must be really wrong with me. Or I could sort of externalize that a little bit and say, well, maybe I wasn't at my best that one time, but I'm not going to conclude that I'm that way all the time. It was just a temporary setback, a temporary mistake. I can even externalize it further and say, boy, that individual sure missed out on a good opportunity by not following through with me. That may sound a little bit arrogant, but I think it's more useful for, for one to take that perspective and hold on to a sense of one's own real value rather than interpret the failure, the rejection as, gosh, I guess I'm not very lovable, attractive, interesting after all. You don't serve yourself by drawing that kind of deep personal conclusion. If you do get a rejection, you have to interpret that rejection as not necessarily telling the entire truth about you. Maybe it happened in a certain place. Maybe there's a certain aspect of your behavior interaction that you can change, work to improve, but to personalize the failure so deeply is really a disservice to yourself. You don't have to do that. You can look at your mistakes as temporary. Yeah, just that one time. You can look at them as rather limited in where they occurred. Yeah, it happened in that situation. It happened in that setting. 
as opposed to happening everywhere. And you can interpret that setback as non-representative of who you are, what you can bring, and what kind of future you can have. I think it's really powerful to think about it as not as as being temporary. I often say to my clients, as think about a failure as a stepping stone. You know, it's something you're stepping over and you're moving forwards onto the next thing. And, and and maybe it's and maybe that mistake is just getting you closer to the desired outcome that you're after. Maybe now you know something that you didn't know before, and now that you know that, oh that makes the next opportunity all the more likely to turn out in your favor. It is, again, ladies and gentlemen, it's not what happens to us. It's how we think about what happens to us, which aspects we focus on, how we respond to the ups and the downs in our lives, how, we, how much emotion we put into an episode of success and progress versus an episode of um, disappointment and setback. It's how you think about it. And there are ways to think constructively. And there are obviously ways to think destructively. Take your pick y'all as we say down south in the US. <laughs> yeah, and the idea that actually, we can choose a belief that serves us. You know, such an interesting idea. You know, let's let's choose the belief. Yeah, it was their loss that they didn't want a second date. You know, choosing to believe that because actually that's going to be the most helpful thing for you to help you to move forward and feel confident for the next person you go on a date with or whatever the Indeed. situation might be. Indeed. And you are worth thinking of yourself in those terms. You are worth thinking that, hey, that fella or that gal lost out on opportunity. You are okay to think that. You are worth it. A remarkable book written by a young American who served in the U.S. Marine Corps in Afghanistan, he threw himself onto a hand grenade. The hand grenade detonated. His body armor dissolved into dust. He suffered severe injuries, but he survived. Usually if you dive on a hand grenade, ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to wake up the next morning. That's it. This young fellow by the name of Kyle Carpenter survived. He was given the United States military's highest decoration, the Medal of Honor. I believe the British equivalent is the Victoria Cross. I could be mistaken about that. And for all the months and years since that incident, he has been thanked for his service by hundreds and thousands of grateful American citizens. His response eventually became not, oh, you're welcome, but you're worth it. My sacrifice, you deserve it. You're worth my sacrifice. You're worth the pain that I went through. He has a deep sense of his own value. He wants to communicate the value to other people. So when we're talking about rejection, when we're talking about depersonalizing that, it's important to remember that, yeah, you're worth it. I'm worth it. We're worth that. We can give ourselves that kind of regard and that kind of positive reinforcement in the most difficult situations, you know, that stinging rejection. Okay, yeah, but I'm worth depersonalizing that a little bit. I'm worth pushing that away and interpreting that rejection as not being a representation of what I can actually do. That's awesome. That's awesome. Can you share just, just finally, are there one or two really practical things people can do now if they want to, if they want to feel more confident? What would you suggest the kind of the key things that people should, should do? Develop a small journaling habit, ladies and gentlemen. This might take you five minutes, but on a daily basis, it can really make a difference. A five minute exercise where you reflect back upon the previous day. If you do this in the evening or late in the afternoon, you reflect on the day that you have just completed. I suppose you could do it in the morning and reflect upon yesterday. I think it's probably better when to do it late in the day, certainly before retiring. And you simply reflect on three things. You reflect where in the past day you gave 
quality effort. Where did you overcome a little procrastination? Where did you make a tough choice? Where did you maybe bear down a little bit and lift a little bit more in the the dumbbell curl or the bench press or some sort of physical setting? Where did you give quality effort? That's your E, E for effort. It might take you a minute or two to find something. The second entry is S. S stands for success. Reflect back on your day and identify something or some things that you got right. Doesn't have to be a big deal. Yes, I answered the question in history class. I hit eight out of 10 basketball shots in a particular drill. What little thing did I get right? Write that in. That's your S for success. So we got E for effort, S for success. Then the final piece of this is the letter P standing for progress. What does it seem like you're getting better at? Over the course of today, over the course of yesterday, over the course of the previous days, write something that you seem to be getting better at, even if it is a small thing. Those three reflections, effort, success, progress, those are deposits, so to speak, in this psychological bank account, this repository of constructive memories. You build that every day, ESP. I think people can remember that. You build that every day so that you're deliberately cultivating a greater sense of certainty about yourself. Yeah, I put this effort in. Yeah, I got this right. Yeah, I'm getting better at this little thing or this that other little thing. If you look for those episodes in your days, you'll find them. You may have to look carefully, but it's worth looking carefully. It's worth making those mental deposits. And if you want to take it a step further, you can go ESPN. N stands for next. ESPN is a very popular all sports network here in the United States. Everybody remembers ESPN. N stands for next. That means what I got to get after tomorrow. What little achievement is important for me to pursue tomorrow? That sort of keeps a fire under my behind and gets me ready for tomorrow. But doing that little reflective exercise is a great way. Anybody can do it. It pays big dividends. Love that. Love that. I hope people are doing that as they're listening, putting it into their phones if they're out and about or writing that in a journal. It sounds like it's going to be really, really helpful. Thank you so much for everything you shared. It's been absolutely brilliant. Where can people find out more about you and uh, what you do? Uh, NateZinser.com is a website available. The book, The Confident Mind, is available from every um, online book retailer. I would be delighted to connect with any of your listeners. And I thank you so much for the privilege of being here. Thank you. Thank you so much.